Welcome back to episode two of The Two Rogers. We're here at Laceby Manor Golf and Spa Resort in the fantastic North East Lincolnshire. Gentlemen, welcome back for episode two. Thank you. Episode one was was fabulous, talking about the, the inner workings of the sport, more things that, that it's been an, an education for both me and Reg in, in a lot yeah. of ways, because we don't, it, it's not our forte in that side. It's certainly not mine sitting here asking the questions. So thank you for the insight into that, Roger. That was fabulous. I su- really yeah, I su- interesting. I suppose after seeing Ray, we'll, we'll go on to talk about, you know, how I got involved, but it was mainly because Roger was my hero. And then going through all of those phases, riding, and then starting a marketing business and doing rider management and coaching riders and winning world championships. And all of the people that you interact with throughout that journey has been really special. And and I'm actually, I suppose, not unique, but there's not so many people that's done that and has that level of experience really. And um, it enables me to see things and see directions that people should go in, I suppose, really. And, yeah. and now, you know, we've, we've all, we've never been apart, Roger and I, and um, he's my best mate. I've always had, so much respect for him. Um, he's been a big part of our Don't family. Our family. <laughs> what? Don't make me cry. <laughs> no, I mean, imagine this. Imagine this. My mum and dad set off in a not very good car to go to Brands Hatch when there was no M25 and you had to go down the A1 and through London to get to the M25 for a day out to watch Roger Marshall racing, right? So there's me, there's my mum and dad, my two brothers and my two sisters in a small car, an Austin 1000, which if you can remember what one of those are, an Austin 1000. And we had to set off at the crack of dawn earlier, probably four in the morning. And we get just before Brands Hatch on the uphill stretch to Brands Hatch from the roundabout where the petrol station is. Yep. And this blue transit is on the side of the road, broken down. And it's Rog. So quick as a flash, my dad sees him. And my dad was a truck driver, so he was quick quick and good a good driver. He's got himself over in and pulled in. Quick, get a tow rope out. We'll tow the van with an Austin 1000. With five, five kids in it, <laughs> we'll tow him into Brands Hatch and we'll think about repairing it then. And what had happened was one of the pumps, a belt had, I think the fan belt had gone on the van. So it wasn't a huge repair, but it meant it was, you know, it was going to seize the engine if it was driven into Brands. So we got him into Brands. So those are the kind of experiences we went through as a family supporting Roger in his early days of racing, which was fabulous, wasn't it? Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Do you remember those times? Of course I do. Well, sort of, you know, just spend down beer I drank, but yeah, most of it. Yeah, I remember, I really do remember Rog uh, being at Cadwell and his mum and dad coming to talk and and that, I believe, I think this is correct, that they used to leave Rog with me for the day uh, while we were racing and Rog used to get on the polish and all that and uh, that was the start of our, well, don't know how many years now, but a very, very long relationship and uh, uh, Rog supporting me. And uh, it, it's like everybody needs somebody sometimes in racing and Roger's given me a, a chance uh, to prove myself in a, in a completely different role uh, with Ryan, but we'll come to that. But, you know, Roger and his brother Ian, Cal, as I call him. Um, they, After Cal Carruthers. <laughs> they, <laughs> when I had low periods, like you're doing racing, you crash, you hurt yourself, it's hard to get going. You know, when you've got people behind you saying you can do it, we believe in you, you're fast here, you're this, and they're all into the bite and they're all into you, you, you your level of uh, goes up. You start believing in yourself again till you actually do get to a level where you know you can do it. And, you know, credit to to Ian and, and Rog and people like that. They, they they made me what I am, really, you know. I mean, what am I, really? A lot of people think I'm a bit strange, but there you go. You know, I, I full credit to them and can't thank them enough. And like Pete and Val, 
unfortunately, Roger lost his mum and dad in the last year. So, you know, they become a big part of my life as well, you know, and uh, uh, especially Val, you know, who used to trust me to look after Rog uh, <laughs> when he wasn't very old, you know, and when he's, I'd pick Rog up at three or four o'clock in the morning, take him to the Northwest when he was really young and uh, Val used to be very concerned and she used to put, put her hand on me and says, you will look after him, won't you, Rog? And I used to say, yeah. Don't you worry, Val, I'll keep his fluids up. <laughs> and that's exactly what you said on the previous He really show. knew what I meant at the time, but, you know, I had to learn him to take the head off of Guinness and all sorts of things. So, you know, I think Val had a lot of respect for me that way. <laughs> I mean, it was difficult for Rog because, and, and for us, me and my brother, we were purely selfish almost because we loved it, absolutely loved it and couldn't get enough of it. And... <clears throat> Rog had a a great relationship with a very clever man called Don Briggs, who they ended up in business together. Um, and in that stable was Rob Mack. You know, Rob Mack wouldn't be where he was in the early days without Rog and Don Briggs, because they provided him with a stable uh, workshop and platform when he was on his two fifty, his three fifty, and uh, in the early days. Um, and he learnt a lot from you, didn't he? Yeah. Rob Mack, to yeah. be fair. And if Rob was here, he, uh, you know, he would sure. concur with that. Of course he would. But it was a difficult thing because Don was steady, not dynamic, but went through the motions. And like any good engine tuner, was always looking for something extra in the bike. Yeah. Now, whilst that's great, it's also a downfall because unreliability sets in. And we had, you know, then Roger was having some unreliability issues through Don changing things that didn't need to be changed, if you like. You know, there's an old saying that there's always more in the rider than the bike. Yeah. You know? And what we did, we we looked at it, me and my brother, and thought, no, we just need we just need something that is reliable, something <clears throat> that is nicely set for Rog and, and give him the confidence. So not that we knew what we were doing, but that's what we Principal, did. That's that? what we did. Yeah. Um, and the year, so Rog ended up employing me as his mechanic. And I went up every day to the farm where Rog lived and worked at the workshop and had some, you know, I'd learned from Don, don't get me wrong, but actually I was putting a TZ750 together as a 19 year old on my own pretty much to run in the, the British Championship at a high level and take on Barry Sheen and Mick Grant and Barry Ditchman and Phil Reed and Ron Haslam and Keith Ewan and and so the list goes on. Um but and we did the match races that year and we had one DNF and it was a cracked piston. But I knew it was going to crack because it was up on mileage and I told George Beale who was the sponsor at the time and he said it'll be all right lad we'll just do another last race we'll just do it but it did Crack the piston. We had one Elton Park. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had a great run. Really, we were leading three championships that year at one time with the Formula One bike, the Peckett and Matt Nab and a Quiet London, who was with us then, Peter Back Nab. But um, leading up to that, um, a lad called Steve Machin, who was British champion two fifty, three fifty, etc., did a few world rounds. Don Briggs was his mechanic and it wasn't. And then I think it's my last, second to last club meeting of the year when I met Steve, I was at Cadwell and um, me and a lad called Rob Aslett, who used to help me, a local lad in Waltham, uh, we was, the bike had stopped and come in the pits and we just took the top off it. And sure enough, the, uh, one of the bearings had cracked and it sucked it up. And, and I said to Rob, I said, well, that's it for the year. I can't do the last meeting. And then all of a sudden this green van stopped and there was this guy called Steve Machin, and obviously we all looked up to then like him and Chapton and all these stars and a uh, little black Jack Russell on his knee. And 
he cut out and he said, what's up, lad? And I said, oh, blah, 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 Stephen. But it, it's coming up to the end of the year, we're not bothering. Uh, my bills up to then were, it was a hundred pound at chance to get your crank done. And I knew I couldn't afford that again. So Steve just helped, he started helping us strip the engine out and we're both looking at each other. Never met the guy, how weird is that? And uh, I had one of them toolboxes where the leaves went like that and my dad's spanners. And <laughs> the next thing is, he puts it in his van and the engine, he says, I've got a garage at Ludford. Uh, come up and see me in the week. And I'm trying to say I haven't got any money. Anyway, put a new clutch in it and some pistons and rebuilt the crank. And I went up and he charged me 20 quid. And that was the start of my relationship with Steve. And, you know, I went up to the garage, served petrol, out where he was at East Parkwith. And, oh, sorry, West Parkwith. And, um, you know, I came home from work one day. Uh, and it was all landlines then, the phones, and my mum says, can you phone the garage? Steve had been at Cadwell, and the bike had seized down the back straight, flicked him off quite slow, went to Louth Hospital on the Thursday, and on the Sunday he passed. And uh, I can tell you it affected my career enormously, just like Roger was on about a minute ago. You know, you need somebody around you, and... Don was quiet and I inherited Steve's bikes for the season. Uh, June, who was his wife, and then just got a little girl then, and Don Briggs and Seth, Dave. Uh, I, But I didn't do very much on them. It was all too much for me. And losing some, first person I ever lost. And we'd already been through a funeral three weeks ago for Phil Aslan, who got killed at Scarborough. So it really brought to my attention what the sport's all about, uh, the dangers. And, you know, I think it took me over a year to get going again. And uh, and that, as time went on and I lost friends in racing it, and I got good, then you don't turn a blind eye to it. You know the danger. But if you're going to make it in racing, I was like just focused and... And with people like Roger to help me, it was amazing, amazing. So when you you became uh, racing together <coughs> after that, well, well, a bit, a little oh, bit yeah. before that, as you were a mechanic, and then you became a rider in your own right. Well, it wasn't. It was like Rog did a fantastic job. We we actually converted a, a milking shed on a farm, concreted the floor. Roger was at Chatterton Zen, and you know. I bought a car, Chris Andrews, Binny as we call him, uh, we used to call them Arkansas, and I give it to Rog and think give Rog 50 quid a week, well, I, that's all I could afford. And uh, George Beale supplied the gear. And then at the end of that year, George, dis- and George's own words, not mine, we're still big mates. He said, I think you, that's about all you're going to do, lad. I'm pulling the plug now. And, so um, uh, Graham Crosby, who we talked off camera a minute ago, um, he was left Mirawaki to join Suzuki with Baz and all them. And um, there was an opportunity. Crosby put my name forward to go with this uh, guy called Wayne Gardner, who I'd never heard of at the time, in 1981 with Mirawaki. And... Uh, London was a long way for Rog to travel to rap motorcycles where it's going to be based. So um, Rog had always been interested in having a go himself. And I think Rog could take the story up after that. Yeah, it was it was one of those things. I was doing a, a motor vehicle technology course at college and my dad was this disciplinarian that said, you've got to finish that. And um, I would have, in a heartbeat, gone and joined the Murawaki thing, but I couldn't for the various circumstances, which meant that I was then in a position where I wanted to try and have a go myself. And I'd got to know a lot of people, obviously. Um, and so 1982, and I, and, I, and I said the story in the last podcast about how I rang Mal Carter and what he had to say, and that got me going with a, with a bike. Um, 
And then in the short space of time, um, I'm looking at being Roger's teammate in Rothman's Honda, which was like quite incredible. You know, I, mean, I remember on a TZ350 winning at Cadwell, but beating good people, Graham McGregor, McGregor Rob Mack, lots of, it was a, it was a, what was then an international stroke <laughs> national race. Yeah. The 350 class then was really competitive. It was like Moto2. And it was everybody at the front. And I kept passing everybody around Coppice and into Charlie's, dropping underneath them into Charlie's. And I, I won. And I'll never forget um, Rog at the top of the mountain, over the fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, which was brilliant because it was so encouraging to know that he didn't watch the race, you know, yeah. um, which was brilliant. So... That encouragement then was reciprocated to me to get to the point where I become teammate. Um, and then that was a, an interesting dynamic because, um, you know, whilst we're mates, then you go, you're on the track. <clears throat> and for the first year for me, I, I couldn't ride the bike. No. I had no idea. It's 16 inch from wheel, an RS500 that had destroyed the careers of many people, including Keith You, and he'd be the first to have me. Yeah, before Rog came, I mean, Wayne Gardner left and I, I recommended Roger to Barry Simmons, who wasn't sure about it, but, you know, he took a chance on getting him and then Roger will take the story up again. Um, he struggled with, I think Roger struggled with the bike, what he says about the front wheel, uh, blah, 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 but I gave him all the encourage. I used to go out. I used to pull alongside him down the straight, uh, and Roger will remember and pat him on the back and smile and and just to get get him going because it, it was a massive decision for me to push him into Rothman's mm. Honda and a big step for Roger because I've been on factory bikes then for three or four years, so I knew the dynamics, everything, and how it worked. And I didn't like these front wheels and that, but. You know, that's, that's yeah. it. That's well, it. That. I mean, it all started in Macau, didn't it? The year before. Yeah. When you and Mick Grant were dicing for the lead mm. and I was third on my private RG500. And they said to me, because word had got out that, <coughs> that Roger put my name forward and Barry Simmons was going to hire me, if you like. And they, him and Granty said, if you want to be a factory rider, you're going to have to start behaving like one. <laughs> And I thought, <laughs> I, <don't really> know <laughs> <what>. <laughs> I thought, I'm, I'm unsure what that means, really. <laughs> so we used to go out then in Macau, and there was a roundabout with a with a bar on it that served pints, and it was the only bar in Macau that had a pint glass. We so called we, it the pint. We bar, called it the we? pint bar, and we always used to head to the pint bar um, as our first port of call before we then hovered around the clubs, yeah. let's call them, um, um, to have a look what was going on. Spectate, if you like, and see what was going on. So we, we used to go to the pint bar. And this particular night we had, you know, we we did hit it a bit heavy. And we had a really good laugh because my brother, Ian, went, had gone to the market and bought a bucket of frogs, of live <laughs> frogs. And then there was... Lep um, beggars putting the hand through the wire fence to where you were sat and put the hand out wanting money. Wow. Okay. You know, yeah. as it was not, you know, and we were friends with the chief of police and everything there. Yeah. We? Which was great. We didn't know Faye Ho then. She would have been a little girl sat watching. Of course, yeah. But, but of course that's her territory. Anyway, every time the beggar put his hand through the fence, her brother put a frog in it. <laughs> Which was a good square <laughs> meal for them out there. I think it is true. <laughs> they don't want to know where that the skewer goes. Don't need to know where that skewer goes. <laughs> <laughs> but what a laugh. You know, we had an amazing laugh. Yeah. There was a journalist then called Chris Carter. Yes. Who had a harem of, let's call it just a harem of people following him everywhere. And he kind of was running the show from um, um, a PR perspective. Mainly young boys. Yeah. And, and Mike Trimby engaged with Chris Carter to do this, play this role. And we decided that we were going to turn his fridge off in his room, break in his room, turn the fridge off and fill it full of fish, which is what we did. So you can imagine how well that went down. But to finish the story off, I, wait, I woke up in the morning, this particular morning, 
And I opened my eyes and I thought I was in a jungle. The whole room had been decorated oh, I forgot about with that. every every <laughs> plant and plant pot that they could find anywhere in and around the hotel, including <laughs> this much soil on the floor. I forgot that stuff. Oh my God. And I thought, and I am not a messy person. I like everything just, I thought, oh my God, what the fuck am I going to say <laughs> to the cleaners? <laughs> this is I'm just watching it. And this is him and Granty and Co. Nigel Everett, there was a lot of them. Nick Goodison, they were kind of saying, this is your initiation into yeah. becoming a factory rider. Anyway, we all got our passports taken off us. Yeah. Trimby wanted to know what who'd done what. I obviously said I can't remember because I couldn't. I was unconscious through <laughs> keeping, keeping high fluids. Fluids. Yeah, I was keeping hydrated. fluids up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it got me unconscious in the end. So um, that was a great tale, and we got we scraped through it, didn't we? Somehow, yeah. We scraped yeah. through it, but that led on to this season in Rothman's Honda where I was lost. The yeah. differentiate differential between me and Rog was massive. At the beginning of the season, it was massive. Too far to me even to understand how I could bridge the gap. Um, Honda were great. Uh, Barry Simmons was a believer and Ron Williams from Maxton was great. We did several test sessions and a big breakthrough was a test we did at Snetterton where they put weight on the bike. They put weight under the front fork yoke okay. to put more weight yeah. on the front. And I, I know that it sounds obvious now to anybody watching that's a current rider and they'll think, well, yeah, weight the front, whatever. But it wasn't a done thing then. And the front of those bikes was so light, wasn't it? Yeah. And a 16-inch wheel, you'd think, would give a good big contact patch, but it somehow felt really vague. There was nothing. Well, it was based on Freddie, wasn't it? It was based on Freddie. And he lost the front everywhere anyway. Yeah. So anyway, we got through that. and But towards the end of the year, I figured out, how to do it. Um, and I've got a friend who's got a butcher shop called John Waddingham. And I remember going into his shop and saying, I figured it out. I think I know, I think I'm going to be all right for next year. And he said, well, you'll need to be else you'll lose your job. Cause it was like a two year deal. So, so Rog won that first year. And even Neil McKenzie was strong on the Armstrong that year. Wasn't Gosh, he? Yeah. Cause Armstrong with Chas Mortimer ran a team. Yeah. Donnie McLeod. Donnie McLeod was the other rider. Yeah. yeah. They were 50 Armstrong. Yeah, they, well, they, they were kind Silverstone of a bit Armstrong. bigger. They were kind of a bit bigger CC when they ran in the open class. Yeah. They made them, and they were nimble. So nice to ride. So just an easy bike to ride. Um, anyway, we managed to scrape through to first and second. He, he won easily, but I was scraped into second in the championship. And then the next year, I started winning. And then that was a diff- difficult dynamic for Rog because... He's coached me to actually beat him, which would have been a, a very difficult thing. Yeah, and then the bastard went and won the British Championship. What's all that about? <laughs> but, <laughs> but then, you know, there's, it, it, it's, you've yeah. got people in your camp and Rog had people yeah. in his camp, and then it all can get a bit fragmented if you, <coughs> yes. if you think about it. But it didn't. No. It didn't. And I made, I remember, and he'll tell you, I remember making some questionable last lap moves didn't I? You know, at, at Brands under, in, under into the left-hander before yeah. clearways. I remember end of the straight at Snetterton. But it just happened, if you know what I mean. And your competitive instinct takes over. Of course. That's and what that's, you're there for. that's what you're there for. Yeah. So it's a bit like Ryan and Kyle now. They'll have scraps to the end of the year as teammates that get on well. But an instinct will give one or the other of them that bit of an edge. Um and it was never that we were not the same speed, really. It's just that somebody has to win and somebody has to be second. Always. Yeah. And if there could be two winners, you both are deserving of it. hundred percent. You know. And that year, also, I had um, the Isle of Man TT to contend, which on, in 85, Barry Simmons wouldn't let me ride the 500 there. Why not? He, I, he said I wasn't ready for it. He's a prick anyway. <laughs> Fair. He said I wasn't ready for it. So he only let me ride what we used to call the bull, which was a 750 four-stroke called the bull. It was the bike they rode in Formula One World Championship. Okay. We called it the bull. It was a nice bike. The predecessor actually. to the VFR. Yeah. Like that. yeah. 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 And it was a nice bike to ride, but a big old diesel thing. We kind of thought of it as that, although it was very sophisticated yeah. technically. Fabulous. 
bike actually. So in '85, I'd ridden that and got eighth, I think, in the senior, and then. Um, and then he let me ride my 586. So I'm starting number nine on the grid with Phil Miller because then it was you went in pairs. Yes. Yeah. And Rog was 11. I don't know who you started with. Who was number 12? Klaus Klein. Mm. I can't remember who number 12 was. Anyway, so I'm, I'm on the grid knowing that I'm going to get caught. But Rog was so fast and so deserving of a TT win I kind of thought to myself, if I can finish within 10 seconds of him, I'll be on the podium. Yeah. So that was my challenge. My aim was to do that. So sure enough, on, I think it was the second lap, he passed me. Um, maybe even the f- end of the first lap, I can't remember exactly. But we then rode together, pit stop, the first pit stop together, got out, we're back on the road together. And it was a great, great race, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a great race it was probably the most enjoyable race that I could have ever had to and ride for, with him and for somebody like Roger that experience of TT that's you've got to be brave to follow somebody quick so I was I was there and it was great and then at the end of the second lap we went in the pits and I didn't need a chain my chain adjust in it and Rog did and they were they had to adjust his chain. It was going to jump the sprocket. Yeah, uh, and I got out of the pits and and won. You know that it, Trevor Nation ran out of fuel that year as well, and he was in the hunt. Wasn't Joey's it? steering damper. Joey's broke. steering damper bracket broke, but he was riding a four stroke. Not Trevor Nation had a problem. So it's racing, and it is what it is. But you got to be there to win it. You got to be there. It's exactly. That. You got you got to finish to do it. So so Rog did something I never did win a TT. <laughs> But it was a great experience to race with Rog for that amount of time on the same bit of road and trust each other like we did. You know, you could have, I could have, I could have, you know, passed him a drink as we were going down Solby Strait. We were that close, weren't we? Yeah. It was fantastic fun. Well, you want to one if you did, not <laughs> <laughs> It was fantastic fun. But, you know, Rog had all of those emotional things to deal with. Um, Whilst he would be pleased for me, he's disappointed for himself. That's human and, nature. And, that, and that's human nature, but it is what it is. And it's easy to look back and it not be such a big issue. But at the time, it had to have been a big emotional issue. And then at the end of that year, Honda decide yeah. that they're the disbanding the team. But we didn't know. I was at mm. Brown's Arch the last race when Rog clinched British Championship. And Joey had got hurt. So they asked me to go to Kirkuston. And fill in for Joey. So I did a deal. I think I was flying out on the Wednesday. The truck was going out there. And uh, if I'm right, I think they rang us up, didn't they, to come down on Monday morning. Yeah. We'd, both, we'd normally, we had Rothmans on the cars in all the colours. Yes. Yeah. And uh, they asked us both to go down in separate cars. We thought it might be a promotional mm. thing we were going to do. Yeah. So... They were in Power Road in Chiswick then. So Roger and I pulled up. And we saw the workshops closed. Thought it's a bit weird. Anyway, we went in, didn't we? Yeah. Roger Etzel addressed us, didn't he? Yeah. And it was with sadness that they'd had to close the team down because Rothmans had decided that domestic championship wasn't for them. Um, and they only stuck in Grand Prix, I think, for another year probably from a contractual point of view. Yes. I can't remember exactly. Uh, and I think bike sales suffered a bit that year, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. But I then got sworn to secrecy, which was another difficult thing in a relationship, where I had to go to Slough, somewhere in the Surrey area. Um, I forget exactly the, the name of the place where Rothmans had asked me to go. A man called Sean Roberts had asked me to go. And Sean Roberts met with me and said, uh, we would like to run you on a third bike in the official HRC team. You'll be running a year old bike, which was the difficult four, uh, four cylinder yeah. to ride. But we want you, we'll only do it, but we want you to ride it, run a camera bike. And it was the first time anybody had run a camera bike and nobody wanted to run one. The top guys didn't want to run one. So they needed a camera bike because they wanted to improve the 
TV footage. And there was a guy then called Brian Kreisky. Yes, of course. Who was very much the TV guru, very much the production man that partnered with the Duke marketing people in those days to all the havoc videos. Yeah, that guy, produce all. He? he produced lots of amazing stuff. Yeah, to fair. very exceptionally strange character, um, very exuberant character would be the right description, wouldn't it? Mm, yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, Rothmans gave me the opportunity to do that, which I, I did, um, and that that kind of got me into the next phase. Um, the next year for you? Yeah, luckily I got contacted by my old team. In uh, After the Miriwaki year, Wayne went to Honda and uh, I went to Suzuki in the XR69 with the late John Newbold and Mick Grant. And um, then I went four years with Honda and then I got contacted again which was Skull Bandit team then. So I went with Christian Ed and his dad, Paul. We had one bike each to do the World Formula One Championship, which was, that was its last year, and uh, and do the British Superbike Championship. So uh, I ended up getting another job as well. Which is the important thing, which, is going off in different direct, different but, tangents yeah, within it, the sport. Yeah, but we both got jobs, but... That was the biggest heartbreak of my career when I when I had to leave uh, Suzuki in eighty two because I had pulled uh, uh, Junior Collins and uh, a lad called Nick Goodison and I went I was lucky I'd come back from the Swan Series in eighty one and uh, they decided to take a third rider on in Suzuki so uh, you know it. It was an amazing experience for me to get on on Graham Crosby's bikes. Uh, like Rog said earlier, it was an amazing experience getting the Rothmans on the team. But Heron Suzuki were massive then with well, that. This, this, that's made them. I was yeah. in the last year of the iconic Texco colours. And uh, luckily I took to the XR69 really well. And, uh, um, you know, we had a... A massive year. The blip in that year was losing John Newbold at the Northwest in probably the best road race I've ever been in, uh, that particular race. Uh, so, but apart from that, I was voted man of the year that year by the MCM when it meant something, didn't it? And, uh, you know, I ended, it's a true up, public I ended up yes. with three championships that year under my belt and like I was called Win a Week Marshall in MC and all that stuff. So, you know, it, but at the end of the year, I think that was my first year getting paid. It was, yeah, £15,000. Uh, I joined the team for as a third rider. Um, and then at the end of the year, I, I, I would have stayed for 20. Well, I'd have probably stayed for 15, but I wanted to have a go on a, a GP bike if possible. But um, Honda had approached me because I'd obviously beaten Gardner and Aslan every weekend nearly on that yeah. year. So, yeah. so basically, my third before my third interview at Honda, I practically begged, begged them to just up my money a bit and I'd stay just on the four-stroke and they wouldn't. And I couldn't understand why, really. Anyway, I went to Honda and made up my money to 42000 for the year, plus bonuses, everything. So coming from what I was, having nothing, it was an amazing opportunity. And that's why I joined Honda. But it's the most heartbreaking thing, because I'd, I'd have loved to have stayed on the Suzuki. Mm. I mean, when you think back in those days, though, Rex White ran a great team. And everybody from all over the world came through Suzuki to get into Grand Prix because then the bike to ride in a in a final Grand Prix was a Suzuki, yeah, an RG. So Suzuki GB was like the stepping stone. So Mamola, all of them had come through the factory Suzuki team, hadn't they? And I think it was a bit of payback as well because 
I mean, Roger knows the story, but um, and apart from myself, Barry Sheen gave Roger a good leg up by letting him ride his bike and all that. And and um, Barry gave me a lot of good press after Cadwell one year, and and then in '82 when I got that bike. Um, I finished at the Transatlantic when it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I don't like telling people this story when somebody's not here to defend themselves, but I'm honest and it's true. Um, I finished second to Barry at, in both races at Brands and Freddie Spencer was third in one and crashed in another. And it was a good lineup that year. And we came to Mallory and in the first race at Mallory on the Sunday, Baz had pit me on the last lap. I was gutted because there's about 60,000 people there. It's still a good ride from me because he was on a Akai factory yeah. 500 Yamaha. So anyway, I had a caravan then and Barry called me Lodger, Roger the Lodger. And he came to my caravan and I had quite a few people in it. He said, could everybody leave? And uh, him, Franco and Stephanie came in which is his wife and his father. So, And he said, look, Lodger, you're the only one can beat me and nobody's ever won six transatlantic races. And he says, me and you, which we were quite a bit in front of the rest, which was a surprise at Mallory, uh, but it was one of my favourite tracks. So he uh, said, we'll work the dosh out, you know. Of course. I'd never been into all this big money before. And I forget what... It was. 100 grand. grand. That 100 grand to 100, win six races. To win six. In 1982, wow. which was... Yeah. Wow. Huge sum of money. Yeah. Yeah. So I was on 15 grand and, if it, and bonuses, blah, blah, blah. So I actually did tell Nick Goodison and Junior, and they said, well, it's your career, Rod. You've only just got on a fat, proper factory bike, you know, You'd be stupid because he's on a Yamaha. So I got on the grid. I thought, right, what am I going to do? Anyway, I got a really cracking start. And on my board for 12 laps was plus nothing. And we, I think we broke the lap record six laps on the trot. And then all of a sudden I come round and I thought it said 1.5. Anyway, I was 15 seconds in front on my board the next lap I come round. And Baz just lost the front at the airpin, jumped back on, and he's 15 seconds behind. But at Mallory then, I don't know if you know, at the airpin, you could go up the middle. Anybody could go Watch up, it. like Franco or yeah. Stephanie. Yeah. They'd let him up. And George Beale, my old sponsor, which he'll admit. And there was, a, I came in about four laps after this, plus 15. It was all hanging over the airpin, going like that to slow me down. And I thought, fuck that, I'm not slowing down, <laughs> you know. And I went on to win the race. And I think Baz was pleased for me, but the relationship was never quite the same. And I think that's, I he joined, I think he came on television on the Suzuki. I forget what show it was. And he was joining Suzuki again in 83. Uh, and I think that could have been a bit to do with it. But. That was like, was that sports personality? No, I think it was This what? Is Your Life. Was it, that's it, was, was it? it? Yes. Well, it wasn't This Is Your Life because right I, I was, was invited to that. Mm. Did you get And I went, I did go on This Is Your Life. It, mm. it might have been, Rog, you might be right. It yeah. might be. it could have been. Anyway, it, that's, that's just one of them stories, you know, that that's what we're happened for. in the life, you know, so... Tell me, both of you, your, your favourite memories with, we'll just take it back one step to Wayne Gardner and his time. He, he came over to Lincolnshire, oh. riding for Morawaki and racing across the, the county. You both, he, I think he, he lived out of both of your houses at one point. Well, my worst memory, right? We'll, go, we'll start with start that. There. Let's start with the good stuff. I was told about this Wayne Gardner, never heard of him, went to Daytona. Again, Roger mentioned Chris Carter. He, they run a big chat show then at Daytona before the meeting started. And I was going to meet this Wayne Gardner there. So I was at the bar having a beer and then somebody come up from Murawaki and said, oh, this is your teammate, Roger Marshall, this is Wayne Gardner. And I'll never forget it because I was, I'm a friendly person. He looked me up and down and just walked up. I thought, you Aussie shit, you know, and 
he thought I was just an old fart. So, and then we hardly communicated at all at the meeting. I think we finished 11th and 12th. The bikes were fairly standard. Got back to Lincolnshire. I was in a tied farm cottage then, freezing cold. Roger knows the cottage. And uh, just with an arga, no radiators, a young son, Adam. And then uh, rat motorcycles have said, oh, Mirawaki's been on the phone, Namora. Um, Wayne's coming over, could you put him up? I says, no, I don't even like him. So uh, <laughs> anyway, they begged me. I said, look, a couple of days and that'll do. So he flew into Heathrow. He'd never been here before. <laughs> got the got into King's Cross. King's Cross. I'll never forget Market Raisin. It's on the film, Wayne, anyway. Market Raisin Station in March, snowing, minus two. I went to pick him up in my granada, gold granada. And uh, <laughs> he got off the train in these stubbies, shorts, and... Uh, flip flops wired together with lock wire and a little case and a t shirt. I had to buy him some clothes, and anyway, that was just that was the start of him. He came to live with me. I think six weeks later, he left and got a little bungalow, didn't he? In Rugby, yeah, yeah. But you know, we became we eventually bonded, and probably I become one of his only really, really good friends. Over the years, at the end of the day, probably me and one other, maybe Rog. <laughs> well, I mean, my 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 <laughs> memories are slight. So I'm coming off the back of being mechanic for Rog, and I'm starting out as a club rider. I'm obviously good friends with Rog, and so I'm hanging out with Wayne. Rog is married, and Wayne wants to go out and find out where the girls are. Right, so I ended up having that job of taking him out where the girls were because I knew where they were. But without being, um, without without being disrespectful to Wayne, his his Aussie brashness and I'm Wayne Gardner didn't work well with the local girls. <laughs> it's not going to, is it? Really? Didn't go down well with the local girls. Yet yeah, my kind of nice way with them let's call it charm but yeah, my, my nice way with them did work well so Wayne was always on the back foot when we were out because I was always ahead of him in the queue if you know what I'm saying um, which was which was an interesting dynamic and and then and he never was any help to me whatsoever he never helped me never encouraged me in any way um, and he's only ever thanked me once in his life and that's recently. Oh, really? Yeah, because <clears throat> I met him at Jerez at the MotoGP, and he was there supporting Remy. Uh, and, and we were having lunch together, just reminiscing a bit. And it was easy then when he'd finished his career to reminisce about the good old days. You know, he tried to date my sister and all those kind of things, and my mum did his washing and ironing, and, um, which she did. Um, and he, and he wasn't grateful to anybody for anything. It was all expected, like a typical brash Aussie, you know. But we're sat having our lunch, and he's telling me about this amazing scare that he'd just had in hospital, in Barcelona Hospital. Um, he said, I've had, a, I've had a terrible, the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life, he said, I've had pancreatitis. Well, if you, don't, if you, if you don't know what pancreatitis is, it's an infection of the pancreas. And you get it for a number of reasons. Severe drinking can cause it, which wouldn't have been probably the case in Wayne's case. But So he's telling me how it crippled him. And I said to him, did they find the root cause of it? And he said, no. So I said, right, I'm going to tell you what the problem was. I said, I've had it. Um, I was in hospital for 10 days. It's the most painful thing you could ever wish to have in your life. I, I couldn't believe it, honestly. Um, and we've been involved in racing, so we've had pain. I mean, Wayne's broken his femur. We've done everything, but worse pain for him also. And I said, I ended up going to a professor in Leicestershire, an astro, um, um, gastroenterologist, gastroenterologist yeah. in Sheffield, a professor. 
And he said, I can't believe they've not picked up on what the, the cause of your pancreatitis was. He said, it's, you've, got, you've got hundreds of thousands of, of cholesterol stones in your gallbladder. And what happens is when your gallbladder secretes, it's like washing up liquid. So your gallbladder helps degrease things. Technically, it's like squirting fairy liquid on a plate, you know, a greasy plate. When you've eaten fish and chips or anything like that, your gallbladder acts. And so when it secreted what it secretes, it was dropping these cholesterol stones and they were, stand, they were landing in the neck of the pancreas and becoming infected. Wow. So he said the only way to stop it happening is to remove your gallbladder. So I had my gallbladder removed and not had any problems since. So anyway, I told Wayne this story and he said, ah, okay. And I don't know if he really believed me, trusted me, but guess what? Two weeks later, he had another bout of pancreatitis. And he said to them in Barcelona Hospital, check for cholesterol stones with micro... They're so small, it's microscopic detection and get my gallbladder out. That's what he told them. Saved his life. Incredible. So at least he's grateful for something. Yeah. So he thanked me. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah, that was lucky. Okay. Yeah. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. But he, he would tell you to this day, can't believe it, because it definitely saved his life. Because if you keep getting it, it just your heart packs in in the end. It's the most strain on your heart that you can ever have. Just, <clears throat> yeah. The pain just, yeah. just to the right of oh, it. Oh, it's horrendous. Yeah. Um, I speak from experience. Have you had it? Not the pancreatitis, but I have... Um, this, not really interesting for you at home and listening in, but it's true. If I have fatty food, I get a severe pain here. Right. It'll be so gallbladder. She's gallbladder. Yeah. Cool. yeah so I have um, uh, Lanzoprazole, a couple of yeah. those in the morning and we're all right. 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 Yeah. I think my best moment with Wayne is is when I was, what year would it be? 86. I was on the Rotten's on the year. would be 86. Yeah. Sure, it was 86. Yeah, it was. Cause it was. Well, I'm to win the world title in 87. Didn't it? Yeah, I, I got a phone call from Wayne and uh, he says, you're not racing this weekend in British, British Super Park. I said, no. He said, all oh, right, I'm coming to pick you up. You're going to ask him with me. So I said, well, he said, no question about it. So he came and picked me up in his Porsche and drove down to... Over and crossed over and up to Assen. And the theory was he'd had two sports psychologists. He's had a, a year and a half of horrendous results. And he just said, I think you're the only person who can get me back on track. And uh, Donna was at the motor home when we got there and she said, uh, You boys want some tea? I said, No. Me and him are off into us and sort a few things out of a few beers and and chat through a few things and cut a long story short that weekend we he did wake up with an hangover but he eventually got the idea of drinking again and having a bit of fun and and he qualified pole and won the race and then his autobiography he he said he thanked me for that and because uh, the next year only went to win the world title but. That is purely because he lived with me. You know how sometimes these Aussies work, yeah. don't we? And we knew what Wayne was all about. It was all about wheeling scooters, jumping ditches. You know, he used to drive Barry Simmons crazy. There'd be bent scooters everywhere or something was wrong. So anyway, it was uh, that was Wayne. And and, uh, and I think, yeah, since he retired, he's... He's got a lot, lot of respect for people like Roger and I, and he still keeps in touch, which is really nice. And apparently, then his film's good or documentary, whatever you call it. You will get to see it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's Wayne. It's be beautiful. Um, for yourself, Roger, what were your fondest memories from your times in Grand Prix? <clears throat> well, I think the best. The best times were when I did the wild cards, to be honest, in 86. We did Assen, Silverstone, Monza, and, and Spa. And, it, and I'll never forget this. In Spa, uh, after second FP2, I was fifth. I'd never seen Spa. 
before ever. And this guy pokes his head in the garage and says, who's riding this? So I said, it, me. And it was Kenny Roberts. And he said, hmm. He said, good job. I said, oh, thank you. He said, how many times have you been here? I said, I, I've never been here before. It's the first time I've seen the place. He said, let me tell you, the only guy on the same part of the racetrack every lap, well done. It's incredible, isn't it? Best to come in from Kenny. Kenny, yeah. Exactly. Praise from Kenny Roberts. That, that, yeah, yeah, generally praise yeah. from Kenny Roberts. But for but, that, you know, those, they, oh, but all those races, I went, I went on as a wildcard, and you did. We qualified on the front row every yeah. race as a British Championship <clears throat> rider. Can you yeah. imagine? And But then there were, there were eight on the front row then. Of course, we were doing push starts. Yeah. But it was eight on the front row. So you had a good chance. But it was incredible, really. And then the, the because of the structure, and we go back to that when we talked about BSB earlier, uh, sorry, in the previous podcast, we go back to that structure. Then there was Rob Mack, Ron Haslam, Rog May, Nick. Keith Ewan, Neil McKenzie. There was so many Brits on the grid. Kenny Irons, unfortunately, we lost yes. Kenny, but him. There was so many Brits on the grid, probably 10. Passports didn't matter then? No. John Newell, wasn't it? Dave Parrott. Yeah. Yeah. So we were we were we were fighting our corner, definitely fighting our corner and in good shape. Yeah. Um of course tobacco money or anti tobacco legislation in Germany and UK particularly cut us out, really. We talked about the previous previous podcast about Neil Hodgson, you know. I mean I I, I was distraught as a nineteen year old. Neil was on the front row of the grid with Daryl Beatty, Luca Cadalora, and Mick Dewan at the Argentinian Grand Prix. And he led the race, and we couldn't get him a ride the year after. That's criminal. Well, of course, 19 year old no, Brit. Imagine that now. Having never fallen off the whole year apart from the Erta test at the beginning of the year, and he didn't fall off the bike in any session or race. That was incredible, wasn't it? Yeah, amazing. Shows you what an amazing feel Neil Hodgson has for a motorbike. Yes, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I still say most talented rider that, you know, you would you would ever come across. Lazy sometimes. And he'll be watching, so I'm telling you now, Neil. <laughs> sometimes lazy. Um and and I would say that he regrets that slight lazy bit that he could and when you're very, very talented, you do tend to become a little bit lazy. I it's a little bit easy, doesn't it? Don't you? Hundred percent. If it comes easy, you don't have to you, the talent is there. Yeah. You don't feel like you don't well, have to work for it. Like the Rutters and Sean Emmett's. Mm. Never seen much talent in your life. Mm. Yet getting out of bed's an effort for them guys. Yeah. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but it beggars belief, doesn't it? But when yeah. you look now, we've all got 2020 vision in hindsight. And you get the, well, what if I tried a little bit harder? Where could I be? Neil made a fantastic career with, with your help. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what else could have been achieved alongside it? I mean, I mean it, it, it was, I think, more World Superbike Championships, yeah. truthfully. Um, don't forget that he had to go backwards. He was in the World Superbike Championship in 1997, six or seven, six. Firstly, on a factory Ducati with John Kaczynski as a teammate. What a complicated guy Kaczynski was. was oh my God. Kremlinov Skyo Vodka. Yeah. I believe was his yeah. sponsor, was it not? Yeah. Yeah, he had a screen around his motorhome door and every time he came in he had a routine a ritual and he would be behind this screen you could hear the airline go in and he would take every drawer out of the thing and airline it down and put it back in every drawer his socks came off the airline was on them i mean i'm not joking that guy was a genius but unbelievable in how he went about what he did a friend of mine's dad drove his camper van a few times and he called him the president that was Kaczynski calling this guy the president it was an, a, an older person and he referred to him as the president um, he had that much respect a very respectful lad I, mean, I think he's gone on to do really good things he's real estate isn't he yeah, yeah he's, he's a real estate he's broker. gone on to do really good things so uh, I just I hope he's interested enough to listen to what we're saying but I sincerely hope so what an incredibly talented guy 
Kaczynski was. But for Neil to partner him was very difficult. Virginio Ferrari was the team manager. And then for Neil to go into the next year and Foggy came back. So Foggy was the teammate the next year. And then, of course, the team was centred around Foggy. Neil, Neil wasn't then probably mentally strong enough to deal with it all. Then I moved him into Kawasaki because that wasn't working and he was on the factory Kawasaki with K- K- Kianari. No. Um, Kageyam? Kageyam, no. The other one. Japanese guy. Yes. Um, anyway, he was in there, big green bikes, didn't work out, had to come back to the British Championship in 99 to find his feet again. Colin Wright took him on. Troy Bayless is his teammate. The first Troy Bayless is his teammate, 99. Mm. And Neil's back in BSB with a, with a wake-up call. That was what Neil, that shock to Neil was, oh my God, what's happened? Well, I'll tell you what's happened. All of that is, is now the past and it's about now and moving forward. And then fair play to him. He dug deep, won the championship in 2000, that big battle with Chris Walker, and then went on with GSE in, to do really well in 2001, 2002 against Colin Edwards and Bayliss on factory bikes. Had some of his best rides, really. They won Michelin's, he was on Dunlops, and then won the championship in 2003. But an incredible set of circumstances, really. Um, I could talk about Neil all day because he's a lovely guy. But um, And now, look what he does now. How good he is at what he does now. He is superb at what he does now. Fantastic. And actually, I've gone, I'm going to say this. I'm being controversial yet again. I, if I was the production team at TNT, I would give him more of a role. He has got a prominent role, but it's all diluted. Like there's no consistency Who's the man that does all the grid chats? Who's the man? It's all a bit iffy and bitty. You don't know who you're going to get next, do you? Mm. And Sylvan Gintoli has been good on, on yeah. us. Um, but I think, you know, Neil has got a skill set in, in presenting that where he could take Sorry to interrupt. a bigger role. Just while I remember, Kiri Yanagawa? Yes. That's there it. There we go. Well done. Well done. <laughs> You've got a good memory. Yeah. <laughs> No, he has. He, he's, he has done incredibly well for himself and will continue to do so because he has the enthusiasm still. He's still got that boyish enthusiasm and that come, that has to come across. Mm. Despite, and I think I think we're, we're almost a similar age, I think. Has he, he's not turned, has he turned 50? Um, when, or is he not there yet? No. I seem to It'd think he's just turned 50. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're exactly the same age. Yeah. Um, but to still have that, Enthusiasm for it's like Rog now at, at sixty five <laughs> still has that enthusiasm for life and and the the infection plus tax a lot plus v eighty like plus v eighty yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reg tell me about your time on the roads the northwest and the TT and the, and the battles with with Joey Dunlop I know what Rog is thinking anyway uh, what's he thinking yeah oh, I'll tell you a story in a minute um, <laughs> yeah, I had a bad burger I think. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was an incredible uh, tough time against Joey. Joey. Joey was so underestimated. He could still do it on the short circuits if he wanted, however, if he, if he felt like it. But when it came to riding on the roads, Joey would be prepared to do anything on the road. He was a top doer. And, I mean... I think the Irish and everywhere we went, they were grateful that he had a, a somebody to take him on like myself. I mean, my gra- we go on about great races, but the one time at the Ulster Grand Prix uh, when I won, won one of the races uh, was me and Manaslan, and it was an incredible race, and I was the first one on the last lap to do 119.91, which with the horsepower we had was incredible and took Joey on the last lap. And, you know, I think the Irish fans, if Joey didn't, used to say to me, if Joey don't win, we hope you do, Marshall, as he used to call me. But, you know, it, the Irish, they do respect you. And the, and the road race in them was massive, as Roger had known. Part of the world... Formula One Championship was at the Ulster, so yeah, um, 
he used to do some really incredible circuits like Villarreal and, you know, the year I, I lost the title to Joey, we actually went to, um, was it Belgium? Um, the last race. Zolder. Zolder, the, bas- the last race. I think what, Joey and I went there on equal points. And it was my first year that I was, I was confident I was going to win the world championship. And unfortunately, um, Chris May, who checked the bike over the night before, uh, checked the valves, put a new head gasket on it. And uh, there were some faulty head gaskets from Japan and the bike stopped and boiled. So uh, it wasn't to be, but Joey went and won it again. So, yeah, we had a, the roads. The TT was my, my scariest uh, memories because... I don't think I used to sleep properly till TT was over. Unlike Peter Ickman and all them, who were so relaxed about it. You know, I used to be worried about it, you know. And I think more so then, because on the four strokes, Roger would back me up. You used to get the odd oil leak and that. And, you know, there was things that sometimes went wrong on the bike. And that was my biggest fear, not my ability. Uh, so... The, to finish when you did finish the TT and you're on the rostrum, I've got to say what a lot of people say. It's it is one of the greatest feelings, and Rog winning it, it it will be one of his greatest ever achievements in his life because it is a big thing to do. So, and then I was never I was always unlucky at the Northwest. Uh, we had um, I, I had a what well I, in a way I was lucky. That I survived some of the things that happened at the Northwest. The year Tom Aaron got killed, the year Kevin Stowe had his bad accident, the year my teammate crashed in front of me, John Newbold. You know, I'll never forget that. It's what it still sends an horrible shiver down me. Because uh, uh, when John, there used to be um, Junie Perrill, where the chicane is before start and finish. Uh, and then you didn't go into the pits now, you come down where to start you off so we only came down one gear and there was I think five of us in the race into there coming up to start the last lap and I'll never forget uh, John Newbell Noddy as we called him he just touched Mick Grant's back wheel and if we were sat in this room now I couldn't tell you where he went when you're doing 140 it was like somebody had just I didn't see him crash. I didn't see anything. It was just like, where did he go? Because we're going that quick. And then I went down the towards university and it ended up between me and Ron. And and I knew that Alice and his wife and his son were there. And and I just knew that it wasn't going to be very good. So I survived a lot of big scares like that. And it was nice to come away from the Northwest, but it took me about, I think, 11 years to win the Northwest, believe it or not. Um, but uh, we had some of the, some good times at the Northwest, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, I think from Roger's point of view, you've got to respect and admire not only the British Championships that you won, but the success on the roads. They, all those years, it's not easy to battle against Joey and the top guys on the roads for as as many times as Rog did. Agreed. And and it actually, the fact that he was so good at it, good at it, was almost his downfall. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because it meant that Suzuki and Honda wanted you to keep doing it. Uh, you know, they're not going to progress you into something better or different or GP when you can do that job for them. And I always say, why would, for example, why would... Yamaha want top rack to go to MotoGP and they obviously didn't that's why he's left why didn't they because he was doing a good job for them where he was and who else is going to do that job well, now Johnny Ray of course yeah. but what I'm saying is they're not going to do that they've got they're there for a commercial reason and you know Rog yeah. was a victim of his own success in that respect yeah. because he was that good and because the only person that could challenge Joey really um, and Joey was a strange character because he 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 was the epitome of what a racer shouldn't have been. 
<laughs> not what you should be. Yeah. And like how he ever survived Villarreal from a heat and dehydration point of view, I'll no. never know. No. And he and he could do it, but it was like he, it's like taking an Irishman to the Spain and asking them to lay in the sun all day. They're not going to be able to do it, are they? Not really. Sheer bloody mindedness. Yeah. But anyway, it was it was all great and Barry Simmons was very focused on Joey winning, let's say. Without there being any <laughs> hidden agendas, let's say Barry was very focused on Joey winning for whatever reason. I think, you know, the Honda Irish market was big. Um and and I'm not suggesting any foul play in any way, but it you knew where Barry's commercial commercial angle was with everything that he did. There was always a, a reason, you know. Um, but yeah. then, you know, there's always a lot of fun to be had when you're at those events. And, uh, you know, I, I had the <laughs> difficult job of telling Barry Simmons at the Northwest that Roger wasn't going to be able to race because he had food poisoning, you know, and he's laid in the hotel. Um, and look, I mean, unlucky for Rog, because Mick Grant was there at the time. And Mick Grant said, I bought him a pint of it last night. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I do actually believe there was a food poisoning issue. Yes. Um, but of course, Rog got the tag that he'd had too much to drink the night before and couldn't race. But there was actually a, a severe food poisoning bout that um, he didn't manage to, and he just came at the wrong time, you know. And timing's everything, isn't it? Yeah. Everything and nothing else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before we finish this this episode, one thing that I would like to ask you about, Rog, to just delve into a little bit deeper, something you said on the previous podcast. I don't know how much you can go into the whys and the wherefores. Tell me the story about Honda and Neil Tuxworth and then riding for Suzuki because we only seem to... Oh, for me? Yeah, for you. Oh. Because that, that there was more to be told there, but we, we kind of ran out of time. So, well, well, I mean, it's disappointing when you've had a career with Honda and you've helped Honda through a difficult period. So from, from the team stopping, as we talked about, through to 1990 when it restarted, there were those years when I was still representing Honda. So in 88, for example... Um, Bob McMillan got me bikes from the factory to do the World Superbike Championship. Well, I think there weren't, there was me, Virginia Ferrari, Stefan Mertens, and Fred Merkel that got special parts. Then for 1989, and, and I put my own team together and financed to make that happen, to represent Honda. And then for 1989, the same thing, although we did get more special bikes in 89. There were more factory prepared, let's say. Um, and so then, but you're still putting your own neck on the line and your own finances on the line to make it happen. And then to be asked in 1989, if I could recommend somebody that could run the team, because they were talking about restarting it, Bob was to, wanting to restart it. And I suggested that Bob should meet Neil Tuxworth. Um, so this a meeting was arranged in Lav. And Neil got appointed the job. And me and Rog both went to see Neil Tuxworth in Cardiff Hospital after he'd had his bad crash. Horrendous, actually. And it was a terrible thing that he'd been through. But I was very disappointed that in 1990, he didn't keep me. Mm. And he, he employed uh, James Whittam and Carl Fogarty. Um, that was his choice. But I, found, I, I felt really hurt by that, that I wasn't kept on when I'd done what I'd done, not for, just for Honda, but also for him, um, to get him in that position. Um, I did I did go back the year after because it didn't work out with Jamie Whittam. I don't know how many bikes he crashed that year. He'll, he'll tell you when he sees you. <laughs> and he won't, be, he won't be shy about telling you either. <laughs> but he did crash quite a lot of bikes that year. And, and that was... And, and, of course, Neil, being um, an accountant, didn't like spending over spending on budget. So crashing bikes was not a good thing um, when you're part of that team. So I did get the opportunity to go back in 91. Um, Neil McKenzie was in the team that year, but 
But then Neil got left the team halfway through the year to go on a Suzuki in Grand Prix. Do you remember? I forget if it was Pepsi or... It was Pepsi. Pepsi. Yeah. Pepsi. Yeah. Pepsi. Yeah. It was, because it was Ron on that, at that time yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was. It yeah. was and, and something happened, and halfway through the year, he left. And then I got his bike, which was a more of a, again, a more of a factory bike in the team. I think Hizzy was in the team that year as well. Um, like factory RVS. Yeah. So I got like a third, a, a, a third wheel, if you like, a third um, go at it. But that was the end for me. So that was that. It was, everything was coming to an end. And, and and it was, if it had continued with Honda consistently, it might have been different. I might have had a different feeling about things. So This is the bit why it was important just to, to, to cover that because you had such a, a strong relationship with Honda through the, the the 80s and for it to come to a sudden stop for me, I couldn't quite understand that one it no, if I knew what I know I know now I would probably have said I'll stop and do it myself yeah when mm. Bob McMillan asked I probably should have said that that'll do I'll do it myself I'll do it because I could I've done yeah, it and, absolutely. and I would have enjoyed it and done you know I'd have enjoyed doing a good job so, um, but anyway, it's all water under the bridge. Absolutely, it was just something I we picked up on the on the previous yeah. on the previous show. I think what we all know is that that's another another hour and ten minutes. So there's another episode for you. That's episode two completed. We'll be back shortly with episode three. Stay tuned. <laughs>